This next unit will cover living things in their environment. In the first section, we'll look at habitats. A habitat is the particular type of area in which an organism lives. At the moment, my habitat is here in this studio, where I'm quite comfortable presenting this program. A secure environment, air to breathe, the right temperature. Very nice. Seriously, though, there are many different habitats in all shapes and forms where plants and animals live. Goldie's habitat is this tank. It's an artificial habitat, but it mimics the real one, a freshwater pond. Let's look at some others. A woodland river, a rocky seashore in Britain, and the cold stretches of the Antarctic are all examples of habitats. These are just a few of a wide variety of different habitats there are on Earth. The important point to remember is that different habitats will support different plants and animals. Now, you don't need to know about habitats in a lot of detail for your test, but you do need to know that there are a wide variety of different habitats that support different plants and animals. And you need to know that animals and plants live in a certain habitat because they have adapted to survive there. For an animal or plant to survive, it must be well adapted to its habitat. In other words, it has special features, adaptations, which make it perfectly suited to where it lives. I'm adapted to live on land. I have lungs and I breathe air, and I have the limbs needed for movement on the ground. Goldie here is well adapted for life in water. He has gills that absorb the oxygen dissolved in the water, fins to propel himself through the water, and a streamlined, smooth body to give the least resistance through the water. We are both well adapted to our surroundings. This habitat, a shoreline in Britain, supports many different species of birds. Here are two species, oyster catcher and avocet. From their external features, can you write down how these birds are adapted to this environment? While you watch the clip, look at the birds carefully, especially their features and what they are doing. Particularly, look at the size of their beaks, length of legs and overall size. Stop the tape and rewind if you need to go over them again. So, your answer should be that the avocet has long legs and an upturned beak for sifting for food through shallow water. The oyster catcher, on the other hand, has shorter legs and a strong probing beak for searching for food through sand and for breaking open tough shells. Here are some key points you need to know about living things in their environment. A habitat is a particular type of area where an organism lives. Adaptation is where animals and plants have special features which make them suited to where they live. Plants and animals are also adapted to survive seasonal and daily changes in their habitat. Seasonal changes are the differences between summer and winter, spring and autumn, and daily means that they respond differently from daylight hours to nighttime. Why not make a note of the ones you see? So, with daily adaptation, many flowers close at night to prevent damage, and then as light appears and temperatures rise, they open during the day. Many animals will sleep during the day to avoid predators and feed during the night. Examples of seasonal adaptation are trees which shed their leaves in winter to reduce the amount of water they lose when the ground is frozen. Some mammals increase the thickness of their coat as winter approaches, and when food is scarce during the winter months, other animals hibernate. During summer months, the skin of humans darkens on exposure to sunlight to protect them from the increased ultraviolet radiation. So for all animals and plants to survive, over time they have become well adapted to their habitat. And some organisms are also adapted to daily and seasonal changes. 
Remember, life is a struggle, and it might not be obvious, but all plants and animals are well adapted to their habitat. So, we know something about habitats and why certain plants and animals live there. But to understand how they work together, one way of looking at a habitat is to see what is eating what. In other words, the feeding relationships between the species that live in a habitat. And these can be summarised in a food chain. Now, this is a really key concept that you need to know for your test. So, watch this next clip carefully. Here's an example of a food chain. Energy from the sun is stored in plants. Snails eat the plants. Then they get eaten by small birds. Smaller birds are eaten by larger birds of prey. Wow. What's happened here? Well, this sea cow's been absolutely wrecked by slugs and snails. Look, they've had a real banquet. Incredible. I can really see why the numbers need to be controlled. Yeah, but the problem is most people use slug pellets and they kill far too many slugs and snails. But a lot of birds depend on slugs for their food. Yeah, lots of birds love slugs and, as you know, song thrushes are expert snail killers. If there are fewer slugs and snails, that means less food for those birds. Yeah, and it's not just birds, is it? Because slugs and snails are really important in lots of different food chains. So, hedgehogs, birds, they depend on slugs and snails. But there are other animals too, aren't there? Yeah, frogs, toads, slow worms and badgers. And they're all part of their own food chains. You're going to have plant, slug and then frog. Or badger, or toad. So the simple chain's getting a bit more complex. So what you've got is not one food chain, but a whole load of food chains all interlinked and dependent on each other. It's a bit like a web. So our simple chain has gone. Plants are still at the first level, but now slugs and snails are in the middle of a web, with these things dependent on them for energy. And these dependent on those things. Foxes, owls, crows. If there aren't enough slugs and snails, everything else in the food web is affected. The arrows represent the energy flow along the food chain. Remember, the arrows always go from food to feeder. In this case, oak tree to caterpillar to blue tit. A very common mistake is to put the arrow the wrong way round. Copy this one down and try putting the arrows in. Plankton, common mussel, lobster and common seal. Your arrows should have gone from the food to the feeder. So in this case, from plankton pointing towards common mussel and then continuing through the lobster to common seal at the end of the food chain. Food chains give us a good idea of some of the feeding relationships in a habitat, but don't give us any idea about numbers of each species. How many slugs or hedgehogs there are in an environment, for example. Knowing the numbers of animals or plants in an area will help us understand the habitat a lot better. This can be done by using a pyramid of numbers. The amount of energy the fox gets from one rabbit is not enough for it to live. One fox eats 70 rabbits to live a year. How much did the 70 rabbits eat to live? 20,000 blades of grass. We now have another way of showing the decreasing energy being transferred from the start of the food chain to the end. 20,000 blades of grass support 70 rabbits, which support one fox. This is called a pyramid of numbers. Pyramids of numbers usually do look pyramid-shaped, as they represent the decreasing numbers of organisms as you go up the food chain. But there are always some exceptions. Let's have a look at the food chain we saw earlier in the clip. And let's start with the slug's food, lettuces. So the food chain is lettuce, slug, missile thrush, hawk. And if we make this food chain into a pyramid of numbers, we have 200 lettuces, 1,000 slugs, 30 missile thrushes and two hawks. This happens because lettuces are large organisms compared to slugs. One lettuce on average can feed five slugs. 
let's look at some facts about habitats. Here are some more definitions of relationships in food chains. A carnivore is an animal such as a lion or a hawk that only eats other animals. A herbivore is an animal that only eats plants. Rabbits, slugs and greenfly are all herbivores. And omnivores are animals that eat both plants and animals. Examples are ourselves, blue tits and rats. In a food chain, producers are plants which make their own food, biomass. Primary consumers are animals that are herbivores and only feed on plants, the producers. And secondary consumers are animals that are carnivores and only feed on other animals, primary consumers. So, to sum up this section, all living things live in a habitat and life is a struggle for survival. Only plants and animals that have adapted well will survive to compete for resources and produce lots of offspring. There are lots more questions on food chains in the book or on the website. This brings us to the end of the biology section of this programme. We now move on to chemistry, so this would be a good place to stop and take a break before the new subject. Remember, this revision material has been designed in bite-sized chunks to help you through your revision.